Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Percona Live event in Silicon Valley, the heart of Silicon Valley in Santa Clara, California. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. This is the Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise, and, and it's all about the database, it's all about the data, it's all about the cloud, it's all about the enabling developers to build those next generation modern infrastructures. And our next guests are from Rackspace. We have uh, Sean Anderson, product marketing, big cloud, big data solutions, and Daniel Moore, senior manager of database products. Welcome to the Cube. Thanks, John. Glad yeah. to be here. Sean, Thanks and welcome back to you, a CUBE alumni, as we say. We have, we've interviewed over 3,200 people on the CUBE since we started, and um, you're one of them. So uh, we love having Rackspace on because we've been following Rackspace's involvement, certainly in the, the cloud, and then now the beginning of OpenStack, up through now the evolution of OpenStack, and you guys have been a real uh, major actor in, in the, in the build-out of OpenStack, which you know, at the beginning of time, a couple, even just a few short years ago, with Amazon kind mm -hmm. of winning the game in uh, infrastructure as a service, you guys built out your own cloud, you know, did some acquisitions here and there, but for the most part, early days, as developers became more DevOps, you guys were central to that equation, yeah, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, but now we're continuing to see the revolution of the cloud, right? And cloud being the engine of innovation, uh, obviously mobile, mobile first, some people say, and you even had the CEO of Microsoft this week talking about cloud first. Um, we say data first. If you look at data, data is what people store stuff in, non, non, no SQL databases, the structured database, it's not changing, it's a scale equation. So, so I got to ask you, uh, you guys, relative to Rackspace involvement with your customers, uh, about scale and cloud in particular. So where, where are we in, in, in all this and what role does the MySQL community play in that? Sure, so I think you made a great point about kind of you know, data in the cloud. I think what we're seeing now is more of that data natively kind of lives in the cloud and it lives on the cloud from kind of day one, whether it's you know, social data, whether it's machine data, you know, whatever we're collecting, it's not just kind of core infrastructure data, right? And so um, people are saying, well, as long as it's landing on the cloud, uh, why ingest that internally? Can we process it on the cloud? Can we utilize different uh, data technologies to, to, to kind of process it where it lives? Um, and so that's really put the onus on us to create kind of a port so portfolio of data services um, that, that kind of addresses that. And MySQL being, you know, uh, a section that we've excelled in for many years, uh, have a lot of core competency. We really, the onus is on us to be, you know, kind of experts and specialists in MySQL and, and help people understand how they transition those workloads to the cloud. Yeah, Daniel, I want to get your perspective on this because we were talking earlier in a previous day with the IDC guy, the analyst, and they're talking about MySQL. You know, and MySQL has done amazing things, and certainly it's still a revolutionary concept if you think about where it's come from and where it's going. So I want to get your take on it with MySQL now scaling up, if you will. We're seeing even hundreds of thousands of pre-existing developers in MySQL, but new developers are coming in. So what's your, what's your take on where MySQL is and where is it going? Right, so, you know, over the, I was actually doing some research back, uh, I was kind of doing some compare and contrast to like what MySQL did over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years versus what like, you know, MongoDB is doing today. And it's funny to see, you know, you look back, you know, MySQL, garnered the support of the development community and I think building a vibrant ecosystem and allowing for you know multiple you know forks within that ecosystem to exist and we actually see that still growing today. So you see kind of future now well MariaDB is as bright as ever. Percona is still going. You've got a consortium coming out with the web scale MySQL, which I think is just adding to the fact that when people think just when people think that MySQL is running out of steam, you know, the community rallies around it and, and pushes back into it to figure out, you know, as workloads change, as things move to the cloud, how do we sort of bring MySQL forward? Um, and it's not only a world where MySQL exists by itself, more and more talking to customers, we see that they're not just running MySQL, like there's a new stack emerging. It's MySQL, it's with, with MongoDB, with Redis, you know, this, this the new, uh, a new component on the data side of the new LAMP stack that's evolving and how, customers are deciding to build their applications, and MySQL will continue to be a part of that. We're seeing a lot of spectrums emerging, the old school general purpose, scale up kind of environments to on the other end of the spectrum, 
you know, scale out open source. You're seeing the poster childs there, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, a variety of the guys who built their own, right? Yeah. And then every, all these other enterprises are kind of sitting in the middle going, hey, I want to be more like those guys. I don't want the general purpose uh, vendor, disk software. I want to do open source, but I want to make sure it's reliable, right? So that, so that becomes a challenge, right? Because there's talent involved. You've got to have the people. So that's essentially the, what I call the DevOps world, right? That's the DevOps world of, okay, I got developers acting with code, software, using cloud, if you will, or hosted environments on premise or cloud. Uh, is, the, is the unique trend that's driving all these new innovations. And then you tack on that some other complicating vectors like Internet of Things, mm -hmm. um, big data, whatever you want to call it, big data. You know, we had one guy say big data is everything that doesn't fit in the RAM. Okay, <laughs> that's cool, I can see where he's coming from, he's a storage guy. Um, but when you factor in like Internet of Things, all these things, it's like a tsunami of data, yet all the architectures are changing to move to this DevOps culture. So it's pretty complicated to kind of kind of grok all that if you're sure. just a mainstream yeah. guy sitting there, DBA for admin, you know, some sysadmin DBA, sitting around, you know, old gear. What do you guys talk to those guys and what do you say to them? How do you get them from the old way, moving them from one side of the street to the other? I, th I think that's a good question. I think we're in a unique position because we can kind of listen to, um, you know, our current install base and how they're making that transition. And a couple things that we've seen, right? Um, you made a good point about kind of the Facebooks and the Googles of the world. I think everybody wants to understand how these companies leverage the technology, and especially at that type of scale, made that shift to newer technologies because there's a lot at stake when they do that. Uh, luckily, there's a lot of smart minds too to make sure that that's done successfully. Then you kind of have, you know, the, the middle of the road, which, um, you know, they're going to see instant ROI. And, and, and exploring new technologies, and so that's very easy for them. But I actually think uh, bigger enterprises are probably struggling even more making these shifts because they have legacy systems, they have mainframes, they have all of these legacy technologies that they have to put a lot of calculated. Thought. And they got to hire new people. Hire new people. They've got to they've got to integrate with all those legacy systems, and so for them, it's not just a single switch. It's not I have an application. I'm changing the back end of this from one technology to the other. It's I have a whole bunch of systems working in synergy. Um, some successfully and some unsuccessfully, how do I transition that into a new technology and how do I fit that in there with the current capital of people that we have? And I think that's why you see with the newer technologies, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of striving to put in SQL syntax and MySQL type syntax because there's a great DBA community that has been the lifeblood of the success of these systems and they're just trying to break, make that accessible. So let's talk about that for a second before we get yeah. into some of the specifics around Redis and Percona Live stuff and MariaDB, et cetera, here. Um, if you look at the, the mindset of an old school enterprise, you know, they've seen the wars of their generations go from IT, everything's in-house, in controlled developers, whether that's mainframe client server, to outsourcing everything, right? So I'm going to outsource everything, and all of a sudden they lose control. It makes sense if you're consolidating and you know, reducing costs, but now we're, we're on the other side of the spectrum where it's growth and build and monetize, right? Okay, is cloud an outsource model? Or how does someone get the benefits of cloud economically, like almost outsourcing it, if you will, not to say it's outsourcing? but maintaining control, because that seems to be the, the, the issue. Where's the control point? Can enterprises maintain control? Well, you know, I think, I like to think about this not just in a cloud context, but I mean, you look, look at Rackspace, and I think we're uniquely positioned in that, you know, for customers trying to think about where they're going to run their workloads and who they're going to use as, you know, a trusted provider to do that, we have multiple models in which we can do this. So there, there isn't, we don't exist in a world where it's cloud or nothing. Since if, if if you we can bring customers along if they want half of their workloads in a dedicated model, uh, if they want to build their own private cloud uh, because they have trust issues as far as security, uh, we can do that as well. And if they want to bring it fully over in the cloud, we have solutions for that as well. So there's a unique kind of spectrum of services that we can do. Uh, customers that want to do it themselves, uh, we have a model for that, uh, all the way to a full defined as a service, we take care of everything, DBAs on the back end, um, there's kind of a host of options that we can do in order to lower those barriers to entry and sort of get customers over into these new models. And I think what that really speaks to is that they're not ready to fully go cloud. There's a lot of toe dipping involved. There's a lot of consultation that actually happens in transitioning those workloads and transitioning um, in a way that's really successful. And kind of this trade off of, do I want to trade performance for multi-tenancy or ease of operation? And so um, if I can tailor those workloads to a specific technology, um, I'd say that there's, there's, there's probably no one single source of truth for that. I think um, even as Rackspace, we have a, a great public cloud infrastructure 
but we'd be very wary to tell somebody to completely port you know, successful applications to the cloud or to manage because we're there to facilitate them on that journey. And I think that also exacerbates another point, which is where the roadmap becomes increasingly more uh, important. What we see with people looking to make kind of these large scale migrations to cloud infrastructure, they want to know that where they're taking their infrastructure has the items on the roadmap that they want to do. So does this infrastructure provider provide support around Mongo? Because maybe I'm not using Mongo today, but in the future, that's something that I want to do. And data is very hard to move and it's sticky. So if I'm going to put all my data in a single place, um, I should have confidence in their roadmap and confidence in their strategy moving in the future. So I know that moving large amounts of data is not going to be cumbersome if I decide to ch change that strategy. So let's talk about the LAMP stack. LAMP stack is a, um, you know, an acronym about people developing around open source, you know, Linux, et cetera. Um, very easy, a lot of developers came on LAMP stack, but now you have not just LAMP stack, it's a lot of different stacks. So you mentioned Redis and other things. You know, Amazon is the last thing, Beanstalk and other tools are coming in. You know, some people are saying fully integrated stacks is the way to go with DevOps, uh, software as code, infrastructure as code, whatever you want to, how you want to call it. Um, it's not just LAMP stack anymore. It's, I'm a LAMP stack developer, I learned, now I have a lot of other tooling available. Is that going to get more complex? Uh, Daniel, what do you see that with the stack wars? Um. I mean, I guess I don't view it as a, necessarily a, a stack war. I do think that, you know, the gone is the era of I have three database vendors to choose from, and I'm going to pick my one, and I'm going to build my app around it. Uh, we're seeing now more choice as ever in the database market, be it uh, you want non-relational document model with Mongo, or you're looking to accelerate your app with things like Redis, Memcached, or if you're looking for a pure relational model, you've got Postgres, MySQL, multiple variants with Percona and MariaDB. Uh, you know, the list goes on, it's still SQL Server still there, and Oracle's still there, there's, there's immense amounts of choice. And this idea of, I mentioned this earlier, that the LAMP stack in it, its, in its uh, from the, of the past is kind of going away, and you're seeing customers that are choosing multiple of these technologies. And you have things like MongoDB, which is really mirroring a lot of what MySQL did when it sort of came to, came to prominence, in the sense that MongoDB is ridiculously easy to get started with, it follows a, document model that is really, uh, it's close to what programmers want to do when they're building their applications. And so you're seeing proliferation of these databases popping up everywhere, new apps being built on top of them. And you know, along the way, customers having trouble scaling. And so a lot of the developers today, when they're choosing a database technology, they are, you know, a lot of times they're getting to this point where they, they need a database, they need to put their data somewhere, but they really don't want to deal with it anymore. And so you're starting to see a shift of more and more application developers don't want to have to deal with scaling the database, running the database, uh, dealing with you know, uh, partition tolerance and all of these things that happen when they try to scale them in the cloud. And um, that's something that you know, we're trying, you know, as Rackspace, we're bringing in real deep expertise to think about how can we enable our customers to run these more complicated workloads because we live in this world of numerous database technologies behind these applications, the applications of tomorrow. That are so what is, what is Rackspace doing in all this? Obviously you guys have to be the, um, the den of all customers and provide them with the tooling for cloud and deal with a lot of the nuanced use cases. Some are different, different verticals have different use cases. What are you guys doing with the commitment around MySQL and the different forks that some are good, some may not be good, but you, gotta, you have to kind of play both sides of the fence. What are you guys doing? So um, it, it really put the onus on us to kind of create this portfolio of data services. And this is something that's new for Rackspace, but has a lot of steam and I think it's moving really quickly. And it's really to address the problems of today and kind of also address the concerns of where we see the kind of industry going with that. Um, and more and more of our customers, they just want to know that there's some expertise around those workloads, kind of I said earlier. So we now have a data services portfolio. It consists of um, things like cloud databases, which is our MySQL database as a service offering. Uh, we partnered with Hortonworks uh, you know, nearly about a year and a half ago uh, to bring a Hadoop cloud offering, uh, and that's actually based on open standards, pure vanilla Hortonworks data platform. Um, we made an acquisition of a company called Object Rocket that does a very performant way to deploy MongoDB. Uh, another acquisition of a company called Exceptional Cloud Services that does Redis to Go, and this is all within the last year. So you can really see a concerted effort for Rackspace to really start to ramp up the capabilities around data. And then I think that the other part of that that you really spoke to is the orchestration side. So things like OpenStack and um, you know, things like uh, you know,
you know, automation in the cloud, stack automation, orchestration in the cloud, DevOps. I think those worlds really try to, are, are going to kind of collide uh, because you can't have one without the other. You can't have, um, you know, integrated services without an integrated way to deploy them. And, and so let's, let's, let's break this down. So infrastructure as a service, that's one yeah. sector. It's, we all kind of know what's going on there. Let's get some compute storage all integrated, converged in, scaled up whenever, at, at a whim. Um, talk about infrastructure as a service and let's talk about pass right after. Sure. Um, so I think infrastructure service is, is, is a pretty comfortable place for Rackspace. Ten plus years of infrastructure hosting. Um, I think in, in today's world, um, you, you have to start reaching in those application layers to really add value. Um, infrastructure is now a commodity like oil to where people can consume it in, in kind of a brokerage model. Um, so Rackspace really has to try to understand what are, the, what are the things limiting that adoption? What are the things that are inhibiting companies from moving to the types of technologies that they, that they really want to, uh, to consume? And I think that's where platform as service becomes increasingly more popular. And that's a new area for Rackspace. I think we've been in, in the platform game really in the past four to five years That's as right. far as developing cloud products. That's op uh, mainly OpenStack. Yeah, o OpenStack and, and of course our public cloud products that are that are based on the OpenStack technology. We really try to eat our own dog food. Let's make everything on OpenStack and kind of proliferate that. But I, you know, I know Daniel could probably speak more to the platform piece, but that's, we're, yeah, we're let's playing talk, Let's talk platform as a service. We, we covered the IBM Pulse event. They announced Blue Mix with Cloud Foundry. Uh, Rackspace was actually in that press release with a bunch of other people. It looked like a, like a um, you know, good set of industry leaders kind of endorsing that. Um, but Solem's right around the corner, right? Solem right. is not yet released, but you know, very active on <laughs> discussion boards. Um, but there's different approaches in platform as a service. It's thin and, thin and fat yeah. kind of approach. Cloud Foundry, some say, a little bit bloated. Solem is, wants to be more thinner. <laughs> um, and then where's, where's Red Hat in all this? So where, where is the OpenStack? Is the OpenStack fragile? Or is it still agile? I mean, I don't think, I wouldn't use uh, fragile to describe it. I think that um, I would put it more on the agile side. And I do think that, you know, OpenStack is evolving. I mean, it started out, we know, as a uh, pure kind of infrastructure play, right? But it is, um, as the, I've seen the, I was, you know, at the first OpenStack Summit, I saw it, you know, scale from, you know, 200 people to, I think the last one I was at, there was, you know, six to 8,000 people in attendance. This vibrant community that's existed, and I think, the mission and the model of OpenStack has evolved rapidly, and so like that's why I give it that sort of agile stamp, and that they are, you know, they are moving where you know the community and all the different players, you know, IBM's in this, Rackspace is in this, HP, like we're all they're all in there, sort of shaping its direction, and so you're seeing it go from pure infrastructure to having database services to having platform-based services to having orchestration services. Yeah. You're seeing all these layers get built out, and you know I think Solem. You know, we live in this world where, you, yes, you have Cloud Foundry, you have multiple passes, and you have Solem, and it's kind of like, well, this is what, another, another pass provider? But one within the context of OpenStack that lives and speaks and breathes, you know, and, and works well tightly with that OpenStack framework. So uh, there's definitely room for it. Well, competition is always good for the marketplace. At the end of the day, you don't want to confuse the customers, right? So one of the things that OpenStack has uh, provided, at least the enterprise folks that we've talked to at SiliconANGLE Wikibon is, they want to look under the hood. They want composite, they want Lego blocks. Correct. And so, um, I know you're talking to Rick Jackson, um, yeah. you know, he promotes this open cloud concept, which is essentially what OpenStack is. It's not a closed cloud, right? So, uh, we also had Boris on yesterday from Mirantis, very vocal about behind closed doors open source, whatever that means. Um, and I think too that, you know, open, it, Open gets thrown around a lot, right? And, and you know what we have open cloud company as a tagline, right? But that open to me, it's more than just open source, right? Open um, is a, a mi like that a mindset of you know I can, especially in the world of service providers, like open in the sense that I can bring my workloads to you and I can easily I'm not locked into you as a provider, uh, meaning like we could offer you can still offer proprietary software, be it a SQL Server or Oracle, like in a cloud, because knowing that I can take my workload to you, but I can also take it in-house, or I can run it with another provider, I'm not locked in, I'm open in that sense. So certainly open source is a major part of that. So we, and we strive our, I guess we strive to be as open as possible. And many of the projects we work on, I mean, are, we have extremely liberal open source policies within our company because we want to help build these communities, we want to help be purveyors of, of openness, of open source, and I think it speaks well to, um, you know, you know, if you just look at the success of OpenStack and where that's gone. What are we expecting at OpenStack Summit this year? We have theCUBE there live for multiple days in Atlanta. Brawl, is it going to be a brawl? Is it going to be Kumbaya, Love Fest? 
uh, or more of the same? I think as you see the <laughs> ecosystem build out, there's going to be more. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of really high-powered thinkers involved in the OpenStack initiative, and that uh, you know that grows out opinions and it grows out camps of, of ideologies around that. And I think if you look at any open source ecosystem, we see that in Hadoop, people starting to gravitate to certain kind of um, you know ethos of thinking when it, when they're really looking at that. Um, so I think what you'll see is you know continued commitment on the on on the people that are no surprises. So the Mirantises and the, uh, the, the rack spaces of the world. I think what you're going to see is a lot of discussion about you know what is what is the genesis of you know things like Ice House and the, the newer versions of you know OpenStack look like. And for the other distribution providers, how do we provide feature parity but also add value onto what just the, the core OpenStack framework is? A lot of big players in there. Yeah. IBM announcing premier sponsorship. Obviously, you guys are big part of it. You got uh, Red Hat, yeah. huge contributor kind of left out on the dance card with Cloud Foundry, which to me signals some interesting conversations, which we'll see. But last year, you saw a lot of people up on stage at OpenStack uh, with use cases. So it was very much, a, which I like, I hope there's more of this this year, but you had guys up there, it wasn't a big you know, a marketing fest. It was people saying, hey, look at, we're going to show with code. And, and yeah, one of the litmus tests for us is consistently when we go to these conferences, more and more questions about how do I run data workloads on OpenStack? How do I run some of these more complicated stacks on there? So you saw things like Savannah come you know, out. It, like, how do we develop some IP on how to architect Hadoop on top of OpenStack? Um, we're consistently getting more, a lot of questions this year on Trove and you know, how we're dealing with the whole database community on top of that. So that to us says that now people are asking, and they're real questions. They, they have real meat to them, they have real technology, technology merit. So I think um, as we see more of those, those challenging questions, it just proves to us that people are not just on that kind of high level um, you know, theory about what OpenStack can do, yeah. they're actually in there kind of getting their hands well, it's dirty. Because, you know, it's because people are I mean, it's real. People are running it. People are scaling it. People are, uh, there's constant improvements are going back into it. So that's why you're seeing these use cases. It is, um, it's grown rapidly. And you know, the, the value, uh, when people see the value and they are displaying the value and showing that you know, it is there, yeah, open source always wins. We, Dave Vellante and I always talk about that. You know, at the end of the day, in this generation, open source always wins. However, there are a lot of motivated people like looking not to see the win. You see different approaches like SAP HANA, which yeah. was developed years ago. Um, where's the open source version of HANA? Maybe OpenStack will have an element of that. You see IBM with DB2, but they're also involved. You have VMware. <laughs> so, you know, it kind of looks like to me in the 80s, 90s, you know, the, you know, the standards organization is a place where things go to die. Right, it used to be that way, right? Slow it down in, in, in the standards body. So I get a little nervous about that with OpenStack is that it becomes a little bit like, okay, let's slow this thing down with the religious debates around things. What, what do you guys, how do you guys respond to that? Give us some hope. Uh, you know, I think the whole reason in investing in OpenStack, or one of the main tenets in, in, in investing in OpenStack, is the agility of that. It's like we have an ecosystem of people contributing this code. Let's all work together to accelerate the adoption. I think that will uh, that will determine the success of everything. So I think um, as long as the contributors still understand, um, you know where the wheelhouses are and where everybody can add value, then I think that um, we can continue to work in a, in a nice, healthy ecosystem. I think it would be concerning if we saw the writing on the wall that this wasn't happening. So quote on Twitter yeah. three hours ago, Peter Zeitz Z loves OpenStack, is open source, and it fits into the MySQL community, um, and um, POPS doesn't matter with local flash, you know, Percona Live hashtag. Um, Talk about the overlap between the communities. I see MySQL under, is under the hood. It's one of those things where people are building their engines of innovation around open source. MySQL is one of them. And whether you have your own version of sharding or you want to do whatever they want with that, you've got non-persistent, you got persistent, uh, you know, uh, Flash now uh, with compression with Fusion IO, et cetera. Where's the overlap between the communities? Because obviously MySQL is a big part of what's under the hood with OpenStack. Well, I mean, there's. Um you look kind of at, well, OpenStack itself, so let's like take MySQL. Like OpenStack itself, if you're deploying and running OpenStack, well, it's using MySQL on the back end to host most of the infrastructure databases that you use to scale out Nova or scale out Trove, which is a database service. Uh, you have Trove, which is a database as a service, like operational tooling and software to run and scale databases, which uses MySQL. We have many people that have been People that are now at, you know, people are moving between companies, so people at HP that used to work on MySQL. Uh, for a time we had, you know, Brian Aker, straight from the MySQL community that was, you know, very heavily involved in what we were doing with Trove and pushing that forward there. So 
I see a, a lot of overlap between these communities, and I think you take an open source, vibrant community like MySQL uh, and, and what it's been able to do, um, and in, injecting a lot of those people into the OpenStack community, and you're just seeing a lot of similarities in, in how those communities are growing and, and thriving. And you mentioned that, you know, just to answer your question from earlier, is, is are things slowing down, or are we losing steam? And I don't quite see that yet. I do think that, you know, we're still at a point where people are still moving to the cloud. And for those that don't want to move to the cloud, well, they're going to private clouds. And that's where OpenStack is, I think, just starting to pick up major steam as far as people looking for an alternative to uh, do I go to this cloud provider or that cloud provider? Maybe I'm not ready, I'll go deploy. They want flexibility. Then. Yeah, one of the many, there's, and many companies, Mirantis has private cloud, Rackspace, we have a, a private cloud edition. Like, there are um, numerous opportunities for how you can actually take this in-house and leverage, you know, exactly what Rackspace is running to, to offer our cloud. And that's powerful, and I think people see that value. Okay, guys, we're stuck on time here. I wanted to get you guys a final word. I, I, I'd like each of you guys to share with the audience out there, why is Percona Live such an important event right now? It doesn't get the fanfare of you know, the big glamorous events like in San Francisco, Microsoft's got their Build Conference, which is about developers. And hold, that's a whole other segment by itself. But, but you know, it's, it's a very tight community here. It's not a lot of, not a lot of flair. There's a revolution still going on with MySQL, and you're still seeing cloud evolve. And why is this show important? I, I think it's hugely important for us um, specifically to listen. We're really here to listen, to listen to the community, to listen to the ecosystem, because the way that we're able to kind of craft our productized offerings or even decide what do we go out there and build next or who do we partner with to provide these services, it's really based on what the ecosystem is telling us. And so if we have um, you know, assumptions and we come out here and that's not what we're seeing in the, in, in the community, we would rather shift our strategy to understand how can we give people the tools that they're asking for. And so for us, it's very much a conversation and we're having conversations all day long with the people inside the ecosystem. And it's just a way for us to get outside of our bubble, our bubble and kind of put a lens on to really see what these people are seeing, um, talk to people like the, the bigger companies, the Dropboxes and the Etsy's to see how they're doing it at scale, and then talking to the DBA that works at the small mom and pop shop to say, what are your point, pain points and what are you running into? And that will probably heavily influence where we go with our productized offerings, whether they're Rackspace customers or just people we're talking to. Sean, from a technical perspective, why is this important? This show. Oh, I mean, so uh, Daniel, sorry. <laughs> no <laughs> problem. Sean just went, yeah. Um, I mean, from a, from a technical perspective, and, and I touched on this earlier, that uh, the, how vibrant this community is and that you can, you can have core MySQL and you know, multiple variants and forks of, of MySQL existing with Percona and MariaDB, and I mentioned the, you know, the WebScale consortium that's kind of come together. And you know, there are, you know, there isn't, you know, we know as a community from a technical perspective, there's more than one way to solve, you know, more than one way to crack a nut, right, to solve these problems. And people here are coming together and figuring that out as a community. I think, you know, Peter in the keynotes yesterday, he he raised, had people raise their hands, how many people have been here for one year, five years, 10 years, and you know, to see that, one, there's new people showing up here, there are people that have been here, every, every single MySQL conference has come, that this is a community that um, is still growing, still evolving, and um, you know, still sharing you know, great technical advice across. Guys, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Of course, we were, we were talking in the opening segment yesterday and today, it's a data first world we're living in, and I think the revolution of MySQL is going to go to a whole other level um, as web scale, uh, SQL, as you mentioned, is, is the big trend. And it's interesting, the people in the, in, that, in the press release there are people that use data as a competitive advantage. And I think that is the future model, that data is data first will be a really big developer conversation. And I think it's going to come out of the MySQL type communities where people are data full. They're not data vacuums. So, right. so that's where you're going to start to see people who have the data, who use the data, will be active participants in shaping the standards. I think that's going to come from the database side. So I agree 100% with you guys. Congratulations on your success with the Open Cloud. Thank this you. is theCUBE. We'll be right back. And of course, we'll be covering the OpenStack Summit coming up in Atlanta. This is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.